Good morning, Grace. We're going to, before we jump into our message, I want to uh, draw your attention to uh, an insert in your worship guide as well. Uh, we put this in there last week. Uh, there's two sides to it. One says God attitude prayer. The other one says God entrance prayer. Uh, I would love for this to be just a general guide for you over the uh, series that we're in. The God attitude prayer is just a, a simple prayer I wrote based on principles that we learn in the Sermon on the Mount and just principles in prayer in, in general. It's a, a great guide if, if prayer is something that's newer for you or you just want something that kind of walks you through some things that we see biblically to just keep on a mirror in your Bible somewhere where on a daily basis you can use it as a guide uh, just to interact and engage God and to ask him uh, for these things that he's revealing to us through this series. On the back side, the God entrance prayer is, is kind of a a prayer of salvation. Uh, I know every week we have people who come who are checking out Jesus or trying to understand who he is or what it means to follow him uh, and, and, and people are in all parts of that journey. If you get to that point where you are ready to trust him as your savior, uh, this can be a simple guide for you as well. It addresses some of the key things that are important to understand in trusting him in your, as your Lord and savior. Again, there's nothing magical about these prayers. They're simply a guide that you can use to uh, grow in your prayer life as well. So I want to encourage you to put those to use throughout this series. I'll have to apologize. Um, I'm not going to be moving around a whole lot. I'm going to be talking a little softer than usual. I'm really not feeling good this morning, and my throat's very sore. It's kind of numbed up right now. So if I start lifting like this, I, I, I can't feel my tongue at all. So uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the second beatitude today, if you have your Bibles with you, open them up to Matthew chapter 5. And the second beatitude deals with this concept of mourning or grieving, uh, in particular over your sin. We've kind of used the term being broken to give you a concept of it. Uh, I want to show you why I'm using the two passages as we uh, have learned the Sermon on the Mount is broken up into what's called a chiasm. Its outline is kind of in an X form. It starts at A, as we typically do in an outline, and works, in this case, down to H, and then it goes backwards out from there to the end of the sermon. So right now, we're at the B, the second point of it. Uh, that's the Beatitude, which is the second one in chapter 5, verse 4. And then the passage where Jesus expounds on that or explains what it means is B prime with a little apostrophe there, and that's chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. So those are the, the two sections that we're going to look at today as we work through it. So let me read those. We'll pray, and then we'll uh, look at the heart of this message today. Father, I'm just so thankful for the gift of your word, the guide that it is to us, uh, how it addresses uh, even the things that we're unaware of until we open it up. How, it, as your word says, it cuts deeper than any two-edged sword, dividing uh, bone from marrow, uh, getting to the very heart of who we are. And Lord, as you examine our hearts today, I pray that uh, we'll be honest and open with you, and in doing so, we'll come uh, to the only place we can come for the comfort that you offer through your son, Jesus Christ. Please open our hearts, our minds, and our wills to these truths today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, before I read, here's what I want you to pick up today in terms of uh, four things we see in these uh, verses that Jesus teaches. The first is a principle. You're going to see a spiritual principle, which is the attitude that we're looking at. What is an attitude, or what is the attitude that is blessed? So we're going to start with a principle. Then Jesus is going to address a problem, and it's a problem that we all have, and it's a problem that keeps us from experiencing the blessing uh, that he talks about in that first principle. So a principle, then a problem that we all have, then a solution he's going to give us to that problem, and then lastly, he's going to give us a warning, okay, a warning on, on where not to uh, share this, so to speak, if that sounds right, but it is. It sounds a little strange. So a principle a problem, a solution, and a warning. Okay, so let's read together, and then we'll flesh these 
four things out. The second beatitude in Matthew 5, 4, says this. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And then the passage that fleshes that out is in chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, where Jesus says, Judge not, that you not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to say, take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So four things, a principle, a problem, a solution, and a warning. The principle is, is in the beatitude. That's really what he's doing in this message. He's giving you the eight principles that he's going to talk about in the Sermon on the Mount. In this one, he's saying, blessed are those or happy are those who mourn or grieve, for they shall be comforted. Now, two things that are real important in this beatitude to understand. One is uh, the term mourn is, or grieve is, is, is talking specifically to uh, the idea of our sin. It's someone who uh, grieves or mourns over their sin. That's why we've used the term be broken. Be broken about the fact that we're sinful, fallen human beings. He's not talking about mourning just that you're sad all the time, or you're, you're crying all the time over some kind of loss. He's talking about a, a, a deep-seated brokenness over uh, the condition that we find ourselves in. But the promise is, blessed are those who are, are broken about their sins, and then here's the promise, for they shall be comforted. And the way it's phrased, that word comforted, is, is what we'll, we call a divine passive in the Greek. It's a passive verb, and a passive verb is just a verb that, that acts upon the person who's, in a sense, experiencing it. Okay, it's not like, I throw the ball over there but I'm, I'm comforted. I'm the one being comforted. So the verb is there, and we call it a divine passive because the, the acting agent that's doing it is God himself. So blessed are those who are grieved or broken over their sin, for they shall be comforted by God. That's the, the best way to understand what Jesus is teaching in that passage. So here's your first principle that Jesus is talking about. I am blessed when I am broken over sin. I am blessed when I am broken over sin. The reason I'm blessed when I'm broken over sin is because my brokenness will be comforted by God. It's something he promises to do. Uh, not only now does he do that in the person of Jesus Christ, when we are, are finally forgiven of our sins, but in the future, there'll be a time, as it says in Revelations, where uh, every tear will be wiped from your eye. There'll be no more mourning, no more sadness. There'll be a time when you are broken now over your sin, and through that, trust in him, where you'll never experience that sadness ever again. You will be comforted in a way that you've never, ever experienced in this earth. So this beatitude is speaking of a biblical concept uh, we call repentance which is just a grief over our sin and that leads to a turning to Jesus for a different way. Let me, let me just define this a little bit in, in accordance with the Beatitudes and how Jesus is teaching. Because there's a lot of confusion oftentimes about repentance uh, as well as there is about sin. But in, within the Beatitudes, maybe the best way to define sin is any means that you and I might pursue for happiness apart from Jesus. Okay, or blessedness, however you want to translate that word. So if you're seeking to be blessed or, or, or find happiness in any other way apart from Jesus, that's sin. And so a B, Jesus is teaching in a, in a nutshell here is, is when you come to a point in your life where you grieve the fact, or you're broken over the fact that you've tried to pursue blessedness and happiness for, in all areas of your life through some means other than Jesus, then you're going to be comforted. Because it's at that point where what the word repentance means, it means uh, to change your mind. 
That's what the Greek word metanoia means. It's translated repentance. It's not crying or weeping, even though that could be something that does happen as a result of that. It's a change in your mind. It means you're changing your mind about what you think will bring blessing into your life to the only one who can bring blessing into your life. Are you with me? That's repentance. So Jesus is saying, when you get to that point where you're broken over all the different ways you've sought to find happiness or blessedness in your life, and you say, I'm done with that. I'm sick of it. It's never helped. It's never accomplished it. There's only one person who can do that, and that's Jesus. He says, you will be comforted then. That's the only way you'll experience ongoing comfort. That's the the spiritual principle we're going to look at. So it's finding our only comfort in Jesus through being broken about our sinful ways. Okay, now we're going to get into the problem. When Jesus gets into chapter 7 and starts fleshing out this principle, he begins with a problem that we all have. And this is how Jesus often teaches. He addresses what, here's our problem, and it leads us to say, man, I need a solution for that, and then he offers a solution. We're going to see he does that in this passage. So he starts in verse one of chapter seven, he says, judge not that you not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So Jesus is talking about this word in particular, an outward judgment. When you see something outwardly and then you make an inward judgment about something just by its appearance or what you see there, uh, he's saying, hey, you shouldn't judge in that way. Jesus is not saying in this passage that we don't ever judge anything as Christians or we don't ever decide from right or wrong. He's talking about a hypocritical judgment in this passage where we only see part of the facts or only look at the outside and we start making internal judgments about it. And he's saying, hey, don't do that for the same judgment that you pronounce when you're that way is gonna be turned back onto you. So there's a problem, we tend to do that. And then he asked two very pointed questions. These are profound questions. As I was just meditating and journaling and, and, and look, going through these in my own devotional life, I just started asking, okay, why would, why would Jesus ask these two questions? And in doing so, surfaced two really incredible principles that Jesus is getting at in terms of why we struggle. Look at his questions closely. The first question he asks is this. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? That's his first question. He's just asking us, why do you do that? You should stop and answer that. Why why do I do that? Why am I so skilled at seeing the speck in other people's lives and overlooking the log in my own eye? We're gonna talk about that in a minute. Then the second question is is just slightly different. Okay, this one is just seeing it and, and noticing it But look what he says in the second question. He says, or how can you say to your brother? Now you're not just seeing something. You're actually saying or doing something. He says, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? So the first one is about this something that we're seeing or acknowledging or or not acting on, at least with that person. The second one is, is that we actually go and start acting on it. And we start trying to take specks out of people's eyes when we have a log in our own eyes. So here's the problem. As I was meditating on that, say, Jesus, what are you getting at here? And how does it relate to what we just talked to in terms of being broken, being honest and open about our sin? Why is he asking these two pointed questions? And here's what I came up with. Because it's all over in the scriptures. Here's your second point. It's our problem. Is our nature is to hide our sin by trying to judge other people's sins. That's our nature. That's the problem that Jesus is surfacing in his questions. He's surfacing what's true of every single one of us. Where Jesus says, I offer comfort for your sin, and and blessed is the one who grieves over that sin, admits it, confesses it, for you will be comforted by God. We're all still trying to find comfort for our sin. It's just we do it in the wrong place. And here's how we tend to do it. We tend to hide our sin or or comfort our sin, you could say, by judging other people's sins. I mean, let's be honest. We find some kind of warped pleasure in finding someone that's worse off than we are in our sinful life, right? That's typically how it comes out. 
and, and what we do. So Jesus is surfacing that. And let me show you a couple places in Scripture where you see this. In fact, you see it in the very first book of the Bible uh, by the very first two people who ever uh, walked on the earth. That's where it started. Remember Adam and Eve were in the garden, and God told them, you can eat of any tree of the fruit of the, of the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You may not eat from this tree. So that was the one area where they could have sinned against God. They could have rebelled against him. Watch what happens after they eat of it, as we know, and God comes to find them in the, in the, in the garden. Genesis chapter 3 says this. This is God addressing Adam. Have you eaten of the tree at which I commanded you not to eat? I, I, just, I read this and I think of, you know, how many times as we have parents talk to our kids about something we know they did, but we have to ask them to see what they're going to do. Did, did you get your crayons out and write on the walls like I told you not to? You know, did you eat cookies out of the cookie jar when I said you have to wait till after dinner? We already know they did, right? But we're just asking to see where they're going to go. And watch, from the very beginning, this has been our nature to hide our sin by finding or judging another. Look what the man says. This is such a manly statement. The woman whom you gave to be with me, so he blames her first, and he says, you gave her to me, she gave me of the fruit of the tree. So God says, all right, I can see I'm not getting anywhere with this guy. Let me go over to the woman. And while you women are laughing right now, you're, you're up next here, so just hold tight. So he turns to the woman. The Lord God says to the woman, says, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent, he deceived me, and I ate. You see, what Jesus is surfacing in these questions is what has been true of every single one of us from the very first sin that ever entered this world. From that point on, our goal has been to comfort our sin by surfacing it in other people. It's wrong, but it's our nature. And we think if I can find other people's issues and I can surface them and I can spread them and I can do that, it's going to allow me to avoid confronting my own. It's going to allow me to, to stop from being broken over my own sin. See, sin blinds us to our own need and the message of the gospel and leaves us focused on other issues. That's what sin does. It does it to every single one of us when we allow it. The gospel message is, this, is captured in this beatitude. We find comfort or forgiveness, healing from our sins, only when we're broken and acknowledge them before God. But we don't do that naturally. We'd rather surface other people's sins. Let me show you two ways I believe Jesus surfaces that we do this. I'll, I'll put modern applications to them, but I think they're the heart of what Jesus is getting to in terms of his two questions. Okay, the first one is in this first question. Look at what he asks in his first question. He says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Okay, so in this case, the person's just noticing it. They aren't con actually confronting the person about it. So let me share with you, how, as I was thinking through this, where I feel like this manifests itself most often in life today. You can write these in there. I think I put a spot for them. The first is gossip. Gossip. Gossip is the most common form of this or answer to this. So why do you see the speck in your brother's eye and miss it in your own eye? Because what gossip is, it's not confronting that other person. Gossip never goes to the person that actually needs to hear about it, does it? It just talks about what you've seen. Oh, I've seen, you should see what I've seen in this person's life. Oh, you wouldn't believe what I saw my boss do or where I saw this person at. Okay, you see it, you're not ever confronting the person about it. And what gossip is, is when you come across people who regularly expose and discuss the sins of others, you found a person who is seeking to comfort their own sin by exposing the sin of others. That's what we're doing. It's a perfect illustration of, of our fallen nature. When you engage in gossip, what you should begin telling yourself is, okay, when I talk about other people's sins, when they're not present, when I'm spreading those around, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to comfort myself over my own sin. In fact, the worst gossips 
are usually the people that have the worst issues in their own life that they're trying to cover up. The more we gossip, the more we're trying to cover some things up. That should be a red flag for you now. When you come across a person that constantly has to talk about the sins of other people, when you're in a church that's filled with people that have to talk about other people's sins and can't humbly acknowledge and be broken over their own sin, do you know what you've identified? An extremely unhealthy person and an extremely unhealthy church. They're present everywhere, but I want, what I want you to know is that that is not a sign of health. It's actually a sign of doing what we've done in our fallen nature from the beginning of time. Let me expose someone else's sins because I find some kind of comfort for my own instead of the comfort that Jesus says will only comfort those sins. That's what gossip does. You see, until you properly and thoroughly address your own sin by grieving it, by being broken over it, and by recognizing how it hurts you, how it hurts others, and how it hung Jesus on the cross, you will never get over your issue of gossip. You'll have to go to gossip to comfort yourself over your own sin because it's the only other means you have until you recognize how your sin grieves you, should grieve you, should grieve and hurt others, and how it hung Jesus on the cross. Not others. That's, he doesn't make you responsible for theirs. He says, you. That's the first way, gossip. The second way in here is, is more confrontational, like Jesus says. Or how do you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye? So now we have a person that's gone from just seeing it and maybe talking about it to others to this person at least is confronting the one who has the sin and saying it directly to him as opposed to just seeing it and maybe talking about it in their absence. And so here's what I think this most often manifests itself in life in two ways, and I put these in your notes and on the screen as well is unhealthy confrontation or ministry. Meaning unhealthy confrontation is one way in which this manifests itself. I think that becomes pretty obvious to it. Or unhealthy ministry is the other way that this most often addresses itself. You see, we're naturally talented at addressing other people's issues in order to avoid our own. And one way of we avoid finding proper comfort for, for our sin is by confronting others about their sin. Now the harsh person, the rash person, they're easy to spot. You know, you, we all have people like that in our lives, right? They, they can find any little tiny speck in your life, an issue with your life, and they're so unbelievably blind to the huge issues in, your, in their own, right? I mean, everyone knows about it, but them, right? You know what I'm talking about? That's the, that's the real unhealthy confrontational person. They're pretty easy to spot. The other type of person, though, is not so much and may be more prolific than the unhealthy confronter. And that's the unhealthy minister. In fact, there may be no greater place in the world that unhealthy people in this realm hide than in ministry. In fact, some of the people that are most gifted at this issue have the title of pastor or minister. Because here's what they do. They may not be the loud, obnoxious confronter, but they have come to learn that I can avoid my own issues by ministering to everyone else's issues. And as long as I can stay busy helping other people deal with their sin, I won't ever have to deal with mine. In fact, this type of person has found their comfort and their identity in helping other people with their sin. And that's incredibly unhealthy because Jesus says we should find our identity and our comfort in dealing with our sin in him. There's nothing wrong with helping other people. I'm not saying we don't do that. I'm saying where is your identity? And people, this is why so many Ministry families and people in ministry are incredibly unhealthy because they become skilled at dealing with everyone else's sins and they forgot that they need to start with their own. In 
And here's why this is so rarely addressed. Here's why the people that should see it rarely do. Because when, when you have a person like that in your life that's like that, they, their identity is so wrapped up in helping you with your issues that they're always available. It doesn't matter when you call them, they're gonna be there, why? Because if they aren't there, it's gonna crush their whole identity. Oh my goodness, I wasn't there to help them with this issue. I'm, I'm a failure, I'm no good, I'm, I'm worthless. And who doesn't want someone at their beck and call? Let's be honest, don't we all? So the worst thing is that the people whom they minister to will rarely ever confront that type of person because what they'll find out is that it'll help them become healthy. And so you're not really loving those kinds of people, nor are they being loved, the person who's fine in their identity by fixing other people. You're using them. Because if you really love them, you would help them find the comfort they need for their sin issues before they step out to fix others, so to speak. These are the issues that Jesus is surfacing in this as well. My nature is to hide my sin by judging others. The third thing we see in here is a solution. Jesus goes on to give the solution after he surfaces these two questions. He says in verse five, he says, you hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Notice what Jesus doesn't say here. He doesn't say, first take the log out of your own eye, and then mind your own business. Don't worry about other people's issues. He doesn't say that, does he? He says, first take the log out of your own eye, and then what does he say? Then you'll see clearly. You could say, then you'll be healthy enough to begin helping others with the speck in their eye. Third point in the solution to our problem is that I am blessed when I confront my own sin before considering others. I am blessed when I confront my own sin before considering others. You see, there's only one way to take the log out of your own eye. It's not by seeing the log in everyone else's eye or the speck and finding comfort in that. That's not how you do it. It's not by getting really good at helping and fixing other people's with their issues so you can feel better about the issues that you won't address in your own life. That's not what Jesus says. There's only one way you can get the log out of your own eye. It's first by acknowledging that you have one. And secondly, by asking Jesus to remove it. When you get to that point where you take that step, and acknowledge the depth of sin that separates you from a holy father and that only Jesus can bridge that gap. Not your gossip, not your fixing and helping others, but only him can fix that. Then you have began a journey of being a person whom God will be able to use to remove the specks from other people's lives. And when that becomes a regular part of your spiritual disciplines or on a regular basis, just as we see in the Lord's Prayer. You see it in the prayer I, I wrote in your uh, outline as well inside your worship guide, a concept of confession, regularly asking and stopping and saying, Lord, how have I sinned against you today? When that becomes a regular part of your prayer, like Jesus taught his disciples, forgive us our trespasses, is we forgive those who have trespassed against us. When you first acknowledge that you're a sinner, it transforms you into a person who's able to be used by God to remove the speck from others' eyes. Not based on your helping, but you're now healthy because your identity, you feel good about yourself, not because you've helped all these other people fix their sin issues. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. But when you feel good about yourself because your identity is wrapped up in you fixing others, you're this hypocrite that Jesus is talking about. Instead, you are to feel good about yourself because in your brokenness, your sin has been forgiven 
and comforted in the person of Jesus Christ. And when you've done that, you're now filled and ready to take the speck out of your other brother's eye. Just, just think of the image that Jesus uses. It's really a phenomenal issue. Have you, ever, have you ever had anything in your eye before? You ever get a little speck of sawdust or something in your eye? As tiny as it is, it's extremely irritating and hurtful. And yet, you don't grab your pliers and say, let me get that thing out of here. I know I could be, oh, dang it, and you're digging around. You'd never do that. Nor if you saw someone coming towards you with some pliers in their hand saying, I can help you with that, you know, you'd turn and run in the other direction. Who better to take a speck out of your eye than someone who's experienced the pain and struggle and difficulty of having a log pulled out of theirs? They're going to come at it and go, oh, man, that, I know it's small. I, I've been there. Man, I've had huge things that Jesus has had to take out of my eye. And it was painful, so I'm going to do whatever I can to take this out as gently as I possibly can. That's the kind of person you want to help you. That's the kind of person we need to become in order to help others. You see, I'm blessed when I confront my own sin before considering others. This is one reason I share personally from my own struggles when I teach. Because I don't ever want to forget that me, myself, just like you all, has had a huge log in my eye, and I still have some in my eyes. And so by purposely and intentionally sharing some of the ways in which I blow it on a regular basis, how I'm on this journey with you as well, helps me to soften my messages in such a way that they're not less confrontational, because if you've been here for any length of time, you see I'm gonna confront the issue of sin. But I'm gonna do it like Jesus says, I hope to do it, not all the time, unfortunately, but as a whole, I hope to do it in the same way that I would want you to confront my sin. Very directly and very honestly, but very gently, just as I would want to do with you all. And the way we do that gently is by always remembering that we're the sinners, that we're in the same boat, We've been in need of someone to take a log out of our eye so much bigger than any speck that we would ever take out of someone else's eye. Last thing we see in this passage is a warning. We saw the principle of brokenness. We saw the problem that we want to hide our sin by seeing other people's problems and not our own. We saw the solution, confronting our own sin before considering others. And now we have a warning that Jesus puts in here an idiom that's a little tricky to understand until we see what he's saying and then it makes total sense and it's consistent with the rest of scripture. Jesus says in verse six, do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Now to understand this, there's a couple things you need to understand about their culture as well as this phrase that Jesus uses here. Even this little phrase that he uses is kind of st- said in a chiasm like our whole big passage is. He starts with one point, goes to another, and then he goes back to elaborate on that middle point, and then goes back to the first point with his last one. Look at what he says, and, and then I'll flesh out what it means. Do not give dogs what is holy. Okay, there's his first statement. Then he says, do not throw your pearls before pigs. So then the second thing is he talks about pigs. Then he goes back, and the next point talks about the pigs again, lest they trample them underfoot, because that's what pigs would do. If you threw something of value like that, they're pigs, man. They're all over the place. They're just, you know, they're snorting, and they're just trampling. They don't even have any idea what you've thrown in their pen. And he says, or turn to attack you. There he's talking about the dogs. Because if you knew anything about Jesus' culture in that time, the city of Jerusalem had a big wall around it, and outside the city, there's this big ravine uh, that was all the garbage, the junk. It just stunk. He used it a lot as a description of hell. It's where they burn stuff, they threw all the crud. These wild dogs 
would hang out there that he's talking about. These rabid dogs, and they'd eat that junk. They'd eat all the crud that's in there. You've seen dogs like that. We have them wandering around our neighborhood sometimes. They don't even know what's good, right? You try to, hey, puppy, hey, puppy. They don't even care what food you have in here. They're just going to latch onto your arm or your leg. They're going to attack you and totally miss the gift or the food that you're trying to give them. Pigs are just going to trample over it. They're not even going to see it. They're just going to wallow in the mud. Just give us some slop. I'll trample those pearls. The dogs, rather than eating them or trampling it, they're going to go after you. Jesus is talking about the two most common types of people you're going to experience when you share the gospel. And he's actually telling you, don't share it with these people. Once you find out that they fall into one of these categories, don't, don't share it with them. And he's teaching us something that we don't like to hear a whole lot nowadays because we think everyone should hear the gospel because it's about us and not what God says. But there are many times that God told his disciples to turn and go somewhere else when people weren't receptive to the message. He didn't say stay there, continue to debate them, pound it into their face, make them believe it, or judge them right there and send them to hell yourself. He never says that. Well, at least not in the version I read. Maybe... You, you have some extra books in your Bible. But here's what he's saying. He's saying, here's, and here's how I put it for you. I should avoid sharing this truth, the truth that we just looked at, which is really the gospel, that brokenness over sin leads to comfort rather than judging others. I should avoid sharing this truth with those who strongly reject it. And here's those two categories. And I bet all of you are familiar with these two. Here's the two types of people that Jesus says, as soon as you find out that this is the type of person you're sharing with, you just stop and you move on somewhere else and you wait for God to change them and give them a heart to hear. The first is the pig. And here's what pigs do. They don't attack you. They just trample the truth that you share with them. So you're sharing the gospel with someone. You're telling them how forgiveness is in Christ and and you can't do it yourself. They're going to take that message out of the Bible. It's just a joke. And it's not inquisitiveness. It's like, well, really, how do we know we can believe the Bible? You can tell the difference. It's people that just want to slander that. They're going to slander the gospel. Oh, that's such a crock. Yeah, that's a crutch. Who's, who wants to use that? They start pounding or trampling on the truth or the Bible itself or God himself. They just stomp all over it. Anytime you share with them, they're just going to make more fun of that truth. That's the pigs that you just say, you know what? Okay, that's fine. I'll wait till God brings you to a point where you're ready to hear. That's the first type. They attack the message or they trample the pearls. The second is they skip the message altogether. You have that piece of meat, say, for the dog or that pearl for the dog. They don't even look at the pearl itself. They're just saying, I'm going to go after you. And so they, they avoid the gospel message by attacking people instead. So they'll attack you. Oh, yeah, well, I saw, how how can you say you're a Christian because you do this and this and that? You know, I've been to church before. There's just a bunch of hypocrites in there. They start attacking every person that there is. They have every single excuse to avoid the pearl of wisdom that you're giving them. And Jesus says, don't share it. Don't share with the dogs. Don't give it to the pig because this is what's going to happen. And he says, you go on. And it reminds us that he's the one that's sovereign over people rather than us. You see, the reason we don't like that is it removes us from being in control. And Jesus is warning us that the gospel is a stewardship. And this is one area he says, don't bother. In fact, if you read the gospels, you'll see Jesus did this all the time with the people who constantly either attacked him or his message. They were the religious people. They weren't the sinners. Sinners proper. They were the religious people who either attacked his message. <laughs> the Bible says, what, what does it say about a man dies and his sister marries another man and he marries another one and he marries another one. Who's, he, who's she going to be married to in heaven? I mean, come on. That's in the Bible. They attack the message. Or they attack Jesus. He's casting out demons. <laughs> He's casting them out by Satan himself. And Jesus would stop. He'd move on and he'd go find a place that was readily and willing to hear the message. Jesus practiced the very principle himself. That's the beauty of the Beatitudes and the greater beauty of the person of Jesus. He fulfilled this Beatitude perfectly and sacrificially. 
He's the only person who had no sin to hide and every right to judge others. But he didn't. In fact, he allowed his life to end like he was the worst of sinners. You ever think about that? He didn't hide our sin. He didn't brush it under a rug. He confronted it. But he did so by taking it upon himself. He became our sin. Why would he do that? Because he knew it would crush us. It would separate us from his father forever. So he humbly was willing to undeservedly look like a broken sinner for us. He died in what was the most cruel and humiliating death you could ever experience in his time. It would be the equivalent of the electric chair or lethal injection today. Jesus looked like a broken sinner for you and I undeservedly so that you and I could look like a righteous man or woman to him undeservedly. That's the heart of this beatitude. There's nowhere you can go to find comfort for your sin in this world. Try them all. See where they lead you. But only one person will ever bring the comfort that you need, that you're looking for in your gossip, in your confrontational personality, in your, your getting caught up in ministering for your own personal identity. Only one person will ever bring the comfort that you need for your sin. And it's Jesus. He did that so that you and I could have the courage to be broken. Because in our brokenness, we'll finally find our comfort. Just imagine for a minute a church full of people who were broken over their sin. It would be a gossip-free church because we wouldn't need to talk about the sins of others because we're so broken and in need of change over the sins in our own life. It would be a church where broken people in this community maybe for the first time could come and think something other than, oh, I don't want to go to church this Sunday. What if they knew what my marriage was like? What if they knew what was happening in my personal life and the addictions that I'm struggling with? They're afraid to come because they think they're going to be judged rather than be pointed to the one who was judged for you and for me. Imagine a church like that. Imagine the impact it would have on a community of people broken and in need of comfort. Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful for just the beauty of your word. Lord, I... I just never cease to be amazed. Just a handful of sentences, Lord. That's all we looked at today, and it seems like it just opens up our lives like nothing else I've ever read. Lord Jesus, if, if your word is this beautiful, I can only imagine what you must look like. And Lord, we can't sit, wait to see you face to face to experience the comfort that you promise over the sin that we so regularly experience in this world. Lord, please give us the courage to be a, a broken people, an honest people, that, that deal more with our own sin and, and out of our brokenness than are able to gently and in a healthy way help others with theirs. Let us be that kind of church, Lord for your name's sake and for the sake of our community. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.